<laughs> Here we go. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So how is everybody doing? Are y'all running around out there to, uh, you know, tempt uh, God? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I think... Uh, North Carolina has a slight advantage to um, Arkansas in that uh, even though the legislature is controlled by Republicans, mm -hmm. Republicans who have, you know, put themselves on the news uh, all the time. <laughs> the governor, on the other hand, is Democrat. And so... Um, so things are a little bit more balanced um, compared to, I think, Arkansas. Mm. Nonetheless, I, I think I also observe among my friends, among people I know, my network, I think on the like public persona level uh, and on the social media level, uh, it's like, you know, doubling down on like you know stay at home don't don't do stupid things you know all of that but i have to say i think i also note in them you know unofficially off the record it's like i need to go out and do something already <laughs> yeah. uh, which you know it's understandable and um i think to me, at the end of the day, it's that, uh, you know, very Buddhist, perhaps, you know, we have to take responsibility for our own, right, health, yeah. both physical and mental health. Uh, no amount of, like, I mean, in that sense, you know, it's somewhat sort of like the Republican position, you know, no amount of legislation and governance is going to solve your problems you know there's something about that that, 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 that you know as a buddhist i can agree but remember you know i, I maybe with you guys is talking about how remember which tribe you belong to you know you belong to the buddha dharma tribe you know and uh, not buddhism even because that's that's culturally uh, and culturally constituted you know so that there can be so many forms of Buddhisms for so many cultures. But Buddha Dharma, you know, we've taken refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. So we, we should, you know, be uh, mindful of how we belong to a different tribe. But you can also see, like, like the Buddha says, when you see truth in any tradition or faith, you know, you honor and, and respect that truth. So likewise, you know, like there's something about, you know, the, the more general contours of like, what the conservative movement is saying um, that, that, yeah, I can agree, you know, that yes, you know, it is um, no amount of legislating. Um, then, uh, of course, you know, in the end, uh, we, we have to kind of take responsibility for, you know, what we think is wise or not wise and, and as, you know, within reason, you know, um, be educated on what is and what isn't dangerous. Uh, and even that can be so confusing these days. <laughs> so a consequence of the, what they call democratization of knowledge and information has also led to a lot of confusion. Um, so again, there's something that is, that I can resonate with, you know, like the, Mm, the position of like, say the Catholic church, you know, <clears throat> that then led to also the reformation, which is that um, the Bible is not something that you and I can just pick up and read. Right. In the, in the best, in the non conspiracy theory, um, reading of that is something that I, I agree, which also in the Buddhist tradition, we say, you know, for any text, you need to have the proper oral transmission, the instruction that comes down from a lineage, and so all of that. And I think, 
that's in part what the Catholic Church is saying. You know, you don't just like open up the Bible and just start reading because you, you can read, you know, the wrong conclusions out of that. <laughs> um, but likewise, you know, like you can also see the Protestant position of how uh, the Bible being the word of God can speak to you in ways that you don't need someone else to be a mediator for that. So I think like in terms of like having a holistic or what in the Tibetan context is called non-sectarian, uh, rime is the word used, uh, position. I think uh, it's important to recognize rime is not saying that you um, take a little bit from everyone and come up with your own, you know, uh, fusion menu. Uh, Rime is saying, you know, you, you are primarily parked in one tradition. You're primarily parked in one tradition, so to say. But you are also, you, you also remain open and, uh, yeah, open and observant enough to recognize the truths that resonate yeah, among other places in other contexts and to be able to then when when we're able to resonate with that then it becomes a source of support for what we are primarily uh, training in and so this fine line between being clear about you know having taken refuge in buddha dharma sangha what does it mean? It means kind of the Jewish way of putting it, you know, like we have been set apart, so to say. We have been set apart. And that, that amount of pride, I think, is, is, is necessary and helpful you know, to think like we have set ourselves apart, you know. So we necessarily we have to be different. But at the same time, you know, to be able to recognize um, the truths that resonate, you know, in many other places uh, that can help to support uh, what we are doing. And, and that's, you know, meaning of rime uh, or non-sectarian. Um, unfortunately, I think in, in, in the West especially, but I also see that like in Malaysia, Singapore, in places where the Tibetan style Dharma is new, where Tibetan Buddhism is new, Rime often becomes uh, a way to, I guess a way to do it on your own because of circumstance, you know, so I'm not blaming people for that. The circumstance is such that you don't feel like you have access and you in fact don't have access, you know, much access to guidance from teachers that you can consult and work with all the time. Uh, then you feel like, well, then what do I have? You know, I have basically, uh, you know, uh, I will take whatever I can get from wherever I can get. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, again, that is the situation that I think many of us find ourselves in. Um, but then in terms of that, I also want to say, in fact, be careful not to get addicted to wanting to get more information. Information is not really going to help us solve the problem that we want to solve. <laughs> we might think, you know, if I get more information, then uh, samsara can be undone. But it's, it's not information uh, for the most part. We're, we're very informed. <laughs> I constantly say, you know, I think most of us are more informed than Milarepa was. You know, I mean, it sounds like, what? <laughs> but no, I, I believe that, you know, most of us are probably more informed in many other ways than Milarepa was informed, you know. But I don't know how many of us can will achieve the freedom that Milarepa achieved. <laughs> so don't be addicted to 
gathering information. And in terms of relating to teachers, know this, you know, note and know this, that historically, uh, even Milarepa and, and then a lot of many other non-Milarepas, meaning they're not famous, they're not known, uh, they're more likely more what we would be if we were alive that time. They also don't have that kind of access to the teacher where willy-nilly or whenever you have a question, you know, you go knock on his door. Uh, in fact, consulting the teacher is a big thing. And I think there is some, uh, not I think, I know that there is a reason for that which in many ways it's, it's placed back into your own responsibility. Right? I think I mentioned this before, right? Marpa said to Milarepa, whenever you have difficulties, whenever you want to give up, especially, you pray to me. He didn't say, you know, you come back and let's have a talk. You know, he, he didn't say that. You know, he didn't say, you come back and let's have a talk. He said, no, you pray to me. You pray to me and you don't give up. Yeah, so then often when Milarepa does that, uh, sometimes he forgets, you know, he's so defeated. He feels so defeated that he gives up. And then luckily uh, some moment of devotion arises. His thought turns to his teacher. He prays to Marpa and then the answer comes. Is the answer comes coming from Marpa? Well, I don't know. But the answer comes. And the answer comes through the method of Milarepa really praying to Marpa. And then the answer comes. And the inspiration comes. The push comes. So in that sense, you know, I think many of us... Uh, we potentially already have, you know, teachers like that. Uh, then again, it's up to us to know how to relate to the teacher, to the teacher principal. Mm. So the point being, we have, we have all that it takes for us to practice. Don't, don't make excuses. On the basis of Dharma, like, oh, according to this, I don't have a teacher. According to that, I don't have the requisite. I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have the leisure. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough dedication. La, 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 la. I don't have the circumstance. I don't have, no, no, no. We, we, we do. We, we have all that we need already. So, so then, you know, we have to, uh, recognize the the privilege, the uh, great fortune of having those conditions, and uh, we, you know, we apply the teachings. <laughs> so anyway, this is the second day of Sakadawa, according to the Tibetan calendar. Saka is short for Vaishaka. Vaishaka is the name of the fourth month of the year in this calendar system that is used uh, in many parts of Asia, whether East Asia or South Asia, you know, uh, it used a lunar, uh, they call it a lunar Sony calendar, which means a calendar that is a combination of both the purely lunar calendar, which Muslims use that calendar. And then the solar calendar, which is, uh, so what, what the lunar Sony calendar does is that it packs the lunar calendar uh, to the seasons. So in those countries, they would call what we call the regular calendar, the farmer's calendar, because it's, it's pretty stable, right? Mm -hmm. The first month of the year remains basically pegged to uh, that season of the year. 
Whereas the pure lunar calendar, um, which I think Muslims are the only people that I know of. Maybe to Jews? No. Muslims are the only ones that use the purely lunar calendar. And so that one, mm, it moves. <laughs> the first month of the year can be in January. And next year, it can be in February. It can be in March. It can be in April. And so on and so forth. <laughs> Uh, the practical headache of that system is uh, uh, sometimes the fasting month, Ramadan, which just ended uh, yesterday. Mm. But sometimes the fasting season uh, can fall, well, not sometimes, right? Every few years, it will fall in the, win uh, in the summer months in the Northern Hemisphere. And so in that case, you have to fast. The rule is that before the sun rises, you fast until the sun sets. And so daylight is longer. <laughs> As opposed to those years when, you know, the fasting season falls in the winter. You're like, yes, because, you know, you get only a lot fewer daylight hours. <laughs> anyway, I digress. So in the Luni Solar, yeah, Luni Solar, not Luna, Sony. <laughs> Luni Solar calendar that the Tibetans have, uh, the fourth month uh, following Indian tradition is called Vaishaka. Mm. And so the Vaishaka month, according to the Tibetan calendar, uh, started yesterday. So this month is said to be the month where uh, three major events in the life of the historical Buddha took place during this month. And hence, sort of making this month special, creating a set of what we call dendro, which means causes and conditions, mm -hmm. putting in place a set of causes and conditions so that then this whole month is considered a time where the effects of our Dharma practice can be greatly magnified during this month. And then during this month, especially the first four, 15 days of this month. Mm. So on this month, the Buddha was born. On this month, he achieved Buddha. And on this month, he passed away. So these three great events of his life happened in the month of Vaishaka. Uh, in the Theravada tradition, it is said that both, uh, all three of these occurred on the full moon day of the Vaishaka month. But in the Tibetan tradition, actually, it says only two, which is the enlightenment and the great passing away occurred on the full moon. And then on the eighth day, I believe, is when the birth occurred. In some other accounts in the Tibetan tradition, it said that he was also conceived during the month of Vaishaka. And if that was the case, that means uh, he was in his mother's womb for longer than the usual period. Uh, so this month, uh, Vaishaka, or short Saka, and Dawa means month, so the Vaishaka month, Saka Dawa. The, then the culmination of Saka Dawa is right in the middle of the month, that full moon day. And so that's called Saka Dawa Duchen. Duchen means like the great festival, the great festival of Sakadawa, which is the 15th full moon of the month. So in many uh, Himalayan Buddhist cultures, starting from yesterday, uh, people enter into a period of what we would call the equivalent of uh, Lent, the Buddhist Lent. Um, then people take extra vows, you know, people give up meat if they are meat eaters, 
you know, if they drink alcohol, they give up alcohol, people take vows of chastity during that period and celibacy, and uh, then people engage in, you know, giving offerings to teachers, to Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, to beggars, to, you know, people free animals uh, meant for food consumption. Uh, but in a country like Bhutan, which is a Buddhist nation, uh, the whole month of Sakadawa, uh, no meat is sold uh, for that month. Mm. But of course, my Bhutanese friends, they, they're little, like, they're like, ah, all that means is that you stock up before Sakadawa. <laughs> uh, it's also true, you know, like when it's made into a rule by the government, not everyone is inspired to not eat meat. So you just stock up a whole freezer. You have a special Sakadawa freezer, you know, she said. Uh. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> And I spent uh, several Sakadawas in Tibet, fortunate enough. And it's like Plaza City uh, is bustling with like pilgrims coming from all over Tibet uh, for Sakadawa. So very much, you know, very vibrant uh, season. Uh, so it's very, and especially lots of like uh, religious beggars will be in the Jokang area, uh, the holiest of all temples in central Tibet. Uh, in that culture, there is no shame. There is no negative connotation for begging, which is a little bit hard for the Westerners that I've brought there. Uh, but culturally, there's no you know, kind of shame or anything like that. But the Chinese also don't like the begging. The Chinese, like us, you know, kind of think that's, unseemly and and so the Chinese have been chasing away these beggars I think now they're not allowed there um, but but as in traditionally during Sakadawa is seen as a time where both those who give and those who receive are engaged in this interdependence right, of generosity <laughs> so Sakadawa is also a time for doing a lot of acts of uh, virtue uh, so anyway, <clears throat> a very famous verse uh, found across all Buddhist traditions that summarizes the Buddha's teachings is uh, uh, not to engage in non-virtue, to cultivate all virtue, to subdue the mind. This is the teaching of Buddhas. Um, not to engage in non-virtue, right? to cultivate all virtues and to subdue the mind. And this is the teaching of all Buddhists. So for Sakadawa, uh, what you can do is, you know, maybe make a resolve, even though now is day two, you can still start and say that I'm going to uh, every day when I wake up, I'm going to remember this stanza and then do this. You say, okay, uh, not to create non-virtue. So then you kind of take stock of like, is there a non-virtue? You see, most of us are lucky in the sense that we, we don't really engage in the non-virtue in that active way uh, or any of the obvious non-virtues. So for, for, this, for this exercise, for this commitment, you look for something that you know is a non-virtue and uh, that you habitually kind of find yourself uh, going in that direction. So identify one at the beginning of the day and you say, okay, today, I'm going to take great effort in, in not right, creating that non-virtue. Then you also identify a virtue that you say, and today in particular, I am going to um, focus on um, cultivating that virtue. 
And once you you bring your mind to these these two questions, these two, uh, what to abandon and what to adopt, then the third is fulfilled to subdue the mind. To subdue as in like, you know, like breaking a horse, you know, a wild horse, to tame, to tame the mind, to tame the mind. Uh, because the mind is so unruly, right? And dragging us all over the place, you know, creating a lot of misery and frustration uh, for us, you know. Then in that way, you know, uh, the Sagadama period, you know, you, you can embody and actualize the teaching of Buddhists. So that's one suggestion of what you can do. Then, of course, you know, formal practice sessions, you can increase if you are inspired to do so. Uh, but more general would be to direct our attention to uh, abandoning non-virtues and adopting uh, the practice uh, acts of virtue. Anyway, hi, <laughs> again. How's everyone doing? <laughs> um, I wanted to say that I really appreciated the comments you made last week about uh, when I'd asked about kind of dealing with liberal friends who are apoplectic, uh, you know, kind of how not to join in <laughs> with that. And, you know, taking the, 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 the view of, oh, I'm in this tribe, mm -hmm. this tribe, and I've just been mulling that over and trying to see how I can fit my life into that viewpoint. And yesterday during a Dharma discussion in another group, somebody mentioned something that I, I, I kind of a, a little idea that helped with that, which was that when we do that, when we are more calm, you know, around people that are upset, we are offering them a gift. Mm -hmm. And I just, that helped. It put it in a context actually, yeah. that made it seem more inviting. It was more of a carrot than a stick mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to do it like, I shouldn't do this thing. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't be upset. It's more like, oh, okay, if I can do this, if mm. I'm calmer, I'm giving something. I want to mm -hmm. do that. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, give, give, give the situation an alternative. Um, going against the stream is a common theme in the early... Uh, teachings, in the, especially uh, preserved in the Pali Canon, this phrase, going against the stream. Sometimes again, uh, you know, in the later teachings, you know, uh, you know, talk about, you know, natural, natural, natural. <laughs> mm. So especially, you know, like in Mahamudra or Dzogchen uh, or Zen traditions, you know, the natural state, natural, 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 right? Um, in some ways, you know, if I were to critique that, and I will, I will say, well, yeah, but be careful, you know? Because right now, you know, we are so under the power of confusion. Do we even really know what is natural? You know, and then if we are going to, oh, you know, like settle into the natural state, what if we are just settling into a slightly improved version of confusion? <laughs> and we think, oh, that's the natural state, right? So the early teachings, uh, what we quote unquote call Hinayana, is actually very practical. It begins where we can see, you know, like, Look at where the stream is flowing and how long have you been flowing on this stream and going along with this stream and have you found, right, the happiness that you're looking for? 
And if the answer is no, then now it's time to go against the stream. And you're like, but that's so hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, but how long have you gone along the stream? And how miserable that has taken you? Can you see that, right? If you see that, then without anyone teaching you, without should or should not, without forcing yourself, you're gonna stream, you're gonna swim against the stream. <laughs> because you know that there is no alternative to going <laughs> against the stream, you know. So in the early teachings, this phrase is very common. It's like go against the stream. Yeah. Uh, and we we have an incredible ability to read things out of context, you know, confusion is just confusion the way how it works you know so we talk about like zogchen and natural state relaxing into the natural state etc etc right and nobody can debate this point huh? the greatest tibetan zogchen practitioner tibetan huh? not indian who would you say that person is if you know something about zogchen who would you say that person is? The greatest Tibetan Dzogchen practitioner. Guru Rinpoche? Oh, no, he was Indian. See, that was the trick. Uh, <laughs> uh, Milarepa, I don't know. No, Milarepa is not Dzogchen. He tried Dzogchen, didn't work for him. <laughs> Two strikes. Yeshe <laughs> Sogya. Yeshe Sogya. Oh. Yeah, Guru Rinpoche's chief disciple slash consort, Ishesogya, the princess. She was Tibetan. Ah, she was Tibetan. And the earliest and the greatest uh, Dzogchen practitioner master. Can I ask? Um, now, say, uh, uh, well, let me finish the oh. point. If you read her biography, you know, she practiced the natural state until her throat was bleeding. Bleeding from what? Rigorous mantra recitation. Rigorous mantra accumulation. During one of her retreats, she was raped <clears throat> uh, and then recovered from that trauma. I'm not saying we need to do it so difficult, I'm, but I am saying, you know, the, the broader context of relaxing into the natural state, you know, statements like that, that you find Dzogchen, it's in the lives of such individuals. Don't forget that. Even as we read Milarepa, Milarepa talking about, you know, how relaxing, how, don't, don't ever forget, you know, What's actually going on in his life? Yeah. Not to say that we need to go expose ourselves uh, to such dangers you know, or chant until your throat start bleeding because those things in and of themselves don't guarantee you'll get more enlightened. No, I'm just saying that you know, the, the ability to withstand challenges and and, and difficulties huh? is an important quality. It's an important thing, strength that we have to develop huh? for, for our project of waking up. Sorry, Mick, go ahead. No, no, I mean, just hearkening back to uh, the Hinayana and of, of going against the stream. And mm -hmm. that, that basically means going against your stream Dream of habitual mental yes. activities and the way you're regarding the yes. story of yourself. Yes. And, and in some ways, the only way that you can kind of go against that stream is just to come back to the present or just be present. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that and, and try to reside there. Which is in, is connected. I mean, I, I always uh, I always kind of you know the uh, resting in natural mind was always yeah that's for the major league 
players there. I have no idea what <laughs> that exactly means, except that it has to be connected to that of being able mm -hmm. to relax and resist going with your habitual tendencies. And, uh, and, um, and that just, so, I mean, it's, a, it's sort of preparatory to, to that as right? I mean, mm -hmm. of, uh, yeah, just knowing like, uh, shamatha is sort of like really a connecting thread mm -hmm. to the natural state as well. Right. Yes. Uh, but the natural state, you know, like I'm just saying that expressions like natural state and, you know, uh, be careful not to. Yeah. It's kind of like crazy wisdom. Yeah. Forget the context, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've said like, for example, um, you know, the classic um, Zen mind, beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. And so that's one good classic. And so that's one text. And then if some of you might be familiar with uh, some of the publications of, uh, I think Wisdom has done this, some transcripts of um, teachings of uh, Ajahn Chah from the forest, Thai forest tradition. There's some beautiful uh, books like that. Uh, and they're, they're great, you know, these books. Um, and in there, you hear the great masters, whether it's Shunryu Suzuki or Ajahn Chah, uh, talking about, you know, uh, not so tight, not too loose, and be natural, you know, and don't uh, force things, da da da. And, you know, it's like, okay, well, that all sounds good, you know. But uh, what those books don't, what we don't remember, you know, when we read those books is the, the context of those teachings. So Ajahn Chah, for example, for the most part was talking to his monk disciples uh, that have given up everything and, and restricted their worldly possessions to eight things <laughs> and have a little hut that they live in uh, and eat uh, no food after uh, the shadow is more than four fingers long. <laughs> That's how the cutoff point. Uh, and um, daily schedule that begins at four in the morning, uh, regimens of cleaning, sweeping, you know, service. It's within that, that very, you, we would say, you know, very regimented life that then the teacher, you know, give a discourse, you know, relax, don't force it, don't push it. <laughs> don't da 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 but he's not saying you know okay now let's go have some cheesecake you know at five <laughs> it's a relaxation day let's go get some cheesecake ah oh, you still you know once the shadow has become longer than four fingers or two fingers you know no more solids to be consumed you know but relax <laughs> don't fight it you know Likewise with Shunryu Suzuki, you know, like he's talking to folks who have decided to come sit with him 10 hours a day, you know. And he says, you know, don't stress, don't push it, you know. So it's within the container of a discipline that then the language of releasing, of relaxing into it, of, yeah. That, that, that you need those too. Yeah. So don't forget that, you know, I'm not saying don't relax. <laughs> you, you have to take responsibility for your own process, but don't read teachings out of context. I guess that's my point. Don't read teachings out of context. I had an experience sitting, uh, well, like I often do, really, it seems like I, I'm, I'm blessed with uh, uh, results of karma. Most times I sit 
for any length of time and, uh, and, and really unpleasant tensions remain come up. Mm -hmm. And I've, you know, uh, I, I'm so grateful for the uh, opportunity, this teaching to see, you know, to kind of welcome this, like, oh, okay, here's my teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, seriously, I mean, I really feel that sometimes. And, and you know, how can I develop how can I find this place that you're talking about with this discomfort? And it's, mm -hmm. and I feel like the sitting is a, it's a little lab for me to, to experiment with how to find a place in myself where I connect with something where that, where I find a way to live in a different way. And I feel like, you know, I, I mainly have questions. I don't have answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, often, you know, raising the question is enough. I, I say to people, I say, you know, first you come to the Buddha Dharma looking for answers. Then at a certain point, you discover that you're not looking for answers anymore, but you're revisiting, re-questioning your questions. <laughs> I said, that's when you know, yes, now it's starting to work. Yeah, if initially it's giving you the answers, not yet, I'm not sure yet if you... Uh, you know, if, if you have, if it's working yet, because uh, giving you the answers it's, it might just mean, you know, that uh, <laughs> it's very agreeable to your neurosis, you know. <laughs> but when you find yourself questioning the questions that brought you, to the Dharma, then I think, ah, that's when, yes, something's going on now. And some progress is actually happening now. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> then even, you know, oh, I don't need that answer. <laughs> It's like, oh, yeah, no, that answer, that's okay. I don't need it. <laughs> oh, yep, it brought me here. But no, yeah, it was just a way to bring me here. I, I don't need that answer, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's an answer, yes. <laughs> uh, pigeon goddess. Mm -hmm. huh? Pigeon, this pigeon goddess is uh, 91, yeah? Page 91. Oh, you have to go. <laughs> yeah, okay, you that. So, um, more, more fodder for the illustrator. <laughs> pigeon goddesses. <laughs> what would pigeon goddesses look like? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Ears. Mr. Illus yeah, they have ears for earrings to hang in. <laughs> That's right. They have ears. Right. Or at least one of them has ears. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he says on 91, please teach us a method on which to rely for remedying the state with mindfulness. Yeah. And the state that needs to be remedied is the 
ignorant sentient beings with afflictions firmly entrenched. Mm -hmm. That's right up here. How do we remedy this? So he begins, I bow at the feet of Marpa, who is so kind. Grant your blessings that remedies arise well in my mind stream. So let these remedies not just, yeah, let these remedies not just be a list of things that I uh, sort of know, but let them actually work. Let me be able to apply them. You Davies, you, you, you goddesses who are endowed with faith, if you want to practice in a continual way, if you want to keep the continuity of your practice, so practice here is the broader sense of practice. Um, not like just the formal sessions, but maintaining this mindfulness, this awareness. It says inside, within, meditate with the concentration of shamatha. So uh, with regards to your mind, uh, train it so that at will uh, we can have our mind not be dragged around by outer conditions. So shamatha is basically the ability to bring the mind to wherever you want to bring it. So that kind of mastery of the mind. To be able to say to the mind, stop, and it will stop. So if we want to know, you know, like how well our shamatha is going, uh, it says, you know, um, if you want to know how well your meditation is going, look at your post-meditation state. So meaning when you get off the cushion and your mind, you, you see that it has rushed off to some some object, some situation. Uh, if you're able to say, then the minute that happens, you go, no. And then it really knows, it stops. Then you know, okay, shamatha is somewhat mastered now. Then of course, even more mastered than that is when um, it won't even go somewhere else. It won't get distracted. But at the very least, when you're able to tell it to come back here when it's distracted and it will come back, then you know that your shamatha, your meditative concentration is, is now, that muscle right, is, is building now. So inside meditate with the concentration of shamatha to abandon activity is one great ornament. So here activity is like mental activities. To be able to abandon that uh, is a great ornament, uh, a, a good earring for earless pigeons. Uh, to abandon activity. Uh, so this is activity of the mind, uh, this incessant uh, worrying, thinking, planning, yeah, calculating, stop that. Then outside, stably take hold of the antidote to relax body and speech is one great ornament. So part of this antidote is that on the inside, the mind is, is listening to you, yeah, your mind. And then externally, body and speech come to rest. That is a great ornament. Continuously take the seat of mindfulness. To have few affairs is one great ornament. This advice to have a few affairs, that means don't do too much. I think we could all hear this, you know, again and again. Uh, the culture of North America is, you know, generally one that is addicted to doing things. Do, 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 do. If you don't do, you know, idle hands is the work of the devil. <laughs> so 
look busy, you know, do something. Don't just sit there, right? But here it's saying, you know, it's like something's got to give, you know. I was once uh, asked to speak when I was teaching at Davidson College. The human resources uh, department, uh, HR, decided to sponsor some wellness you know, programs. So then they, I mean, it was a very pretentious um, topic, the title. I guess you could get people to come. Uh, something like, you know, they seem to have it all figured out. Come listen to the, uh, you know, secrets, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Ah. What am I going to say, you know? So, so basically, they, they, they got like, you know, representatives from different faith traditions, you know, to do this program. I suppose the health insurance company gives Davidson a discount of some sort when you, you know, do these wellness programs. Anyway, everybody spoke, you know, about how to, um, kind of how to juggle it better, you know, <laughs> uh, how to juggle better. So when it came time for me to say something, I, as, as always, you know, I was, I don't know, too lazy to plan out what I was going to say. Uh, so then I listened to everyone. And when it came time for me to speak, I said, well, I said, first thing is, uh, we can't have it all. So first thing you have to accept is you can't have it all. Something's got to give. I said, this idea that we can do it all, we can have our cake and eat it too, and have a standing ovation. I said, from a Buddhist perspective, that's a lie. <laughs> People are like, Ugh. So, you know, it's like you, you can't you can't do it all, you know. Something's gotta give. So then you have to figure out, you know, what you can give, what can give and what cannot give, and then plan accordingly. There's a limit to how much we can do. And you have to accept that. So here, you know, he says just don't, don't get too many things going on because it will just pull you in all kinds of directions and you lose the seat, this basis of mindfulness, this seat of awareness, the seat of being present because we are pulled in so many directions. Sometimes that's easier, you know, when you're pulled in so many directions, then you don't really need to look at what's really staring at you and you want to ignore it. <laughs> like, I, I got other things to do. You know, when the real important matter, we don't want to deal with. When adverse conditions give the mind difficulty, be on the lookout for the arising of aggression. So this is like, be careful. When things get difficult, then you know you're going to lash out. Uh, in the Lojong teachings, uh, it says, you know, when your mind is under uh, kind of stress of annoyance, mm, you should behave like a wounded animal. Uh, wounded animals, if they get a chance, uh, what they do is they run away from the crowds and, and hide away. Uh, so here, uh, be careful. Uh, we're not saying run away from your friends. We just mean that you got to be careful, you know, not to lash out at people around you. And then often, guess what? We lash out that at the people that matter to us, not so much random strangers. And then uh, we destroy uh, what we have. 
When encountering money and things of desire, be on the lookout for the arising of attachment. When the good stuff comes, right, be on the lookout. When the weapons of harsh speech fall upon you, when you hear you know, harsh speech, you know, speech directed at you, hurtful, harmful, be on the lookout for your ears' delusion. <laughs> As in, wait, did they really say that? <laughs> or my baggage, right? And the baggage sometimes has to do with whoever is saying it and something sometimes doesn't have. It's some other baggage and then we jump into conclusion what hurtful things that we thought this person said. When it's saying cautioning us a lot of times, our ears delusion because we are overpowered by some other stuff that is going on. Then we, we immediately hear those words as very harsh, very hurtful. When accompanying friends that are equal to yourself, be on the lookout for the arising of jealousy. <laughs> and so they, it says elsewhere in some of the other teachings, Lojong as well, it says, you know, when among those who are equal to us, you know, watch out for competitiveness or jealousy. When among those whom we consider lesser than us, watch out for pride. Then it says next, when praise and honor come your way, be on the lookout for the arising of pride. So these five here are the five afflictive emotions. Delusion, confusion, giving rise to attachment and aggression, which further, you know, in combination, produces jealousy and pride. These are the five afflictive emotions. At all times and in every way, tame the evil demons within your mind stream. So tame the mind. Should a hundred learned and righteous ones speak, there would be no better advice than this. Now practice with joy in meditation. When Milarepa had sung that, the devis, the goddesses, rejoiced with great delight. Then, again transforming into pigeons, they went off to the celestial realm. <laughs> Turned back, turned back into pigeons and flew off. That's a great yeah. Page. You could live by that page, huh? Yeah. Say what? You could live by that page. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Many of these teachings of uh, songs of Milarepa, uh, they, you know, they, and, and that's the style of some a book like this. You know, it's it's not a, it's not a treatise. It's not a you know kind of thought out. You know, step one, two, three, four, five. It's much more given. You know, to a specific situation, a set of advice that remains applicable. You know even outside of the context. What do you, um, I ask about, um, on the 11th one about all times and in every way tame the devil, evil demons within your mind stream. Mm -hmm. So personifying those um, um, egoic tendencies as demons, is that? Is, is yeah, that the evil demons are basically all the afflictive emotions. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, but but when you say when they are they calling demons in the way that we think of demons, or is it just a figure of speech of not good? You know, I mean, are you really are are they kind of personifying them as sort of like a little bit separate from yourself that are afflicting you? I think for Milarepa's audience, um, there there are demons. I mean, Just it's like, helpful to think of them as demons. No, he will not say that it's helpful to think of them as demons. He's simply saying, you do experience demons. And for some of us, right, they, they run around in the Capitol building <laughs> across the street from EBS. <laughs> yeah. So good or not good, we do experience them as demons. Mm -hmm. Um, Milarepa wants us to see how that is your experience. Right? We experiencing, we experience them as demons. So then at that point, we don't even need to, you know, uh, open a file to investigate this, the status of their demonness. Right. Right there. Immediately, we need to recognize, I am experiencing them as demons. So regardless of whether they are or they are not, the issue at hand is my experience. And what am I going to do with that experience? <laughs> what should I do with that experience? And that's where maybe seeing them as dreamlike could be helpful. Yes. Mm -hmm. Movie like, dream like. Uh, so it's, it's, it's adopting a stance towards you know, what we experience. So I've sometimes said, right, we could, I mean, and, and definitely Buddhists, you know, have done this. We could try to convince us and others not to be dragged around by our emotions, by trying to undermine the reality of these things that are out there. Undermine, undermining the idea that these things are out there. We, we could do that, but maybe more efficient than that, I feel, at least for me right now, is no need to really uh, prove or disprove that which we think is out there, but with regards to all our perceptions, our experiences, always remember, just, just in the way I just said it, you know, it's, it's pointing it backwards, point back to us. And they say, each time, right, you point at someone, you know, see how there are a few other fingers pointing at you. <laughs> so to me, you know, these teachings are saying that, you know, yeah, yeah, we could go debate and, and using logic and reasoning to show how, you know, the, the, the wall out there is a product of my mind. You could go in that direction. Or you could simply see this as it's a, it's a strategic stance that I am adopting. To say, hey, right here, I'm having an experience of a great day. Okay, well, is it a great day or not? Well, beside the point, I'm experiencing a great day. Likewise, I'm experiencing a horrendous day. Yeah, you know, if you find yourself investing your energy in 
debating or arguing with someone. No, it's a great day. No, it's a horrendous day. <laughs> You're already not doing the main work that you should be doing. So there's a story in the Zen tradition, the sixth patriarch, uh, chants upon two monks, you know, looking at the flagpole and the flag in the courtyard. Uh, winds are blowing and the flag is fluttering. And he overhears these two monks and he walks over and the monks and he asks, you know, what, what, what's going on? The monks are having an animated uh, debate. And the, the two monks said, we are having a debate as to, you know, is the wind moving or is the flag moving? Obviously not an ordinary conversation, right? Some sort of Buddhist <laughs> theology is being debated. Huh? Is the wind moving or is the flag moving? What's moving? And the six patriarch says, you know, the mind is moving. Where you drop the mic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where you drop the mic. And yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> now, if your job is to harness and harvest wind energy, right, <laughs> then you cannot, you know, go, oh, it's the mind that's moving, right? Then you better figure out whether it's the wind moving or it's the flag moving. <laughs> or both you know or neither or whatever right you cannot go the route of oh it's the mind you know people are counting on you to you know give alternative energy source <laughs> judy <laughs> sorry judy knows all about that <laughs> yes that's her that, that, that just it negated everything that we just said because I'm like, I got to go back to everybody arguing over the wind farm, you know? <laughs> I just, I, yes. I, I'm trying to like figure out the cost uh, ratio of three wind farms going in Missouri and Kansas. Ah. I think it was really great. And it's like, oh, this is great. You know, I'm not going to worry about work and everybody arguing and I'm going to stand <laughs> and said, if it's a wind farm, but, but now you need to argue differently, right? Exactly. This is the beauty of it. Now you argue with passion, but no residual energy. You know, now you argue, you know. And in Tibetan history, I can tell you, and they went beyond argument. Some of these figures even have to go into open conflict with someone else. That's the reality, you know? Like, like physical conflict. There were wars fought amongst different groups. Even after Buddhism arrived, people lived their lives. People fought their wars, you know? Yeah. Uh, not if you listen to Robert Thurman, you know? He, he has an alternative telling of history. <laughs> <laughs> alternative facts. Um, no, Tibetans continue to have conflicts, continue to be real people with, you know, fighting. And some of them include, you know, actually what tradition will say to be realized beings. You know? yeah. we just so they, they fought, their, they debated their windmill debates, you know, yeah. but differently, we say. You can, you can, you know, you can do what we've been saying, you know, argue the issues, you know, like, like what hate this, hate the sin and not the sinner. <laughs> yeah. So on the conventional realms, you know, there are still this morning, I talked about this, you know, on the conventional realm, you know, there is social justice to fight for. And if your job uh, is to do that, you have to do that. Uh, there's economic justice to fight for. And if your job is there, you do that. But for most of us, that's not our job, you know. We're just these ridiculous, like, um, mm -hmm. cheerleaders. <laughs> that, in fact, is not doing and it's not making an, a, an inch or even a fragment of an inch of a difference. We're just self-righteous 
telling Facebook and whoever happens to read our feed on Facebook how <laughs> righteous we are to, you know, insist this and that. Because your neighbor with the opposing view, I doubt, you know, that she was looking on your Facebook righteousness and go, oh my God, I never thought of that. Now I've changed my mind. He's right. <laughs> it's just signifying, right? Which tribe you belong to. And yet we spend so much energy there. It's, it's kind of a waste of energy. But in your case, it's not a waste of energy. You're advocating, right? For alternative source of energy, fight that. But now with the understanding of what we have been talking about, you know. <laughs> so you still chop wood and carry water, you know. But yeah. differently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. July. Yes. Um, I, I, now I can't remember the context, and I so I can't tell you like which presentation uh -huh. that I'm watching. But I heard you use some some language that um, that I hadn't heard before that I thought was really um, specific and descriptive in a really great way about the the mind, and you called it um, uh, the architecture of our internal prison. Yeah, yeah, this morning. <laughs> it was this morning? Yes, this morning. Oh. <laughs> like a lifetime away, huh? <laughs> I thought it was yesterday. <laughs> no, this morning, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we have to dismantle that architecture. We have to dismantle that. Yeah. We have built up a prison. Uh, we have allowed, you know, the structures of oppression uh, to be built uh, in our own experience, in our own minds. Then we have to defend it, we have to fight it, we have to protect it. Uh, so that we have to dismantle, you know, because, <laughs> you know, we are trapped in our own prisons, prisons of our own making. Right. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, this is Buddha, you know, the moment he achieved enlightenment, he said, the first thing he said is like, oh, you architect, I have seen you now. Oh, right, right, right. And you shall not build anymore. You're, you're busted. Your job is over. He's talking about the architect of his prison. It's like, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with you. You know, no more building. <laughs> You are now evicted. <laughs> demon architect. Say what? <laughs> demon architect. Yeah, demon architect, right. <laughs> Definitely in mind, I guess. Yes. And these demons, you know, these demon architects, you know, they're, they're all, all, all very, uh, usually all very professional clean cut looking in suit and ties with graphs and charts, you know, to convince you of the reasonableness of their arguments. <laughs> so they, no, they don't come with horns and pitchfork and tails, you know. They come with suit and ties and reasonableness and charts and pie charts and, you know, PowerPoints and <laughs> See how reasonable we are, <laughs> how trusty we are, you know. And we're just a dream. Yes. <laughs> and yes, even that, they will even tell you that, yeah. And we're just a dream, so. <laughs> <laughs> right? It says uh, the devil, you know, can quote the Bible really well. <laughs> chapter and verse he needs to he knows his enemies you know so he, he can quote scripture too <laughs> this 
seems I, I was really touched with this Lozion teaching, and I'm trying to understand. Mm -hmm. You know, when when we get that, okay, yeah, there's these pie charts, and there and these are just a dream. It seems maybe what to fall back on because that's focusing on the objective. But to fall back on, oh, this is what is seeing this, the birthless awareness. Yes. Because there's nothing experiencing this. Mm -hmm. It's an interdependent arising, right? Then interdependently, things can change. So there's a lot of possibilities of where this may or may not go as well. And then there's an, also an element of, um, if you could say, playfulness. Uh, because the fifth line in the absolute bodhicitta, the post-meditation training, right? Be like a child of illusion. Or I think Tumba Rinpoche has it, like master of illusions. Um, so in that way, once you understand that it's a dream, then you can, for the benefit of those who are still in that dream, but don't understand that it's a dream, you can do a lot of things. So as in like fighting the windmills, <laughs> you know, once you understand more the nature of emotions, feelings, right? Then you figure out how to make it work. You know, it seems to me like that's the kind of time we're living in is that so many things we thought were real mm -hmm. have dissolved. And um, in addition to the fear and, um, you know, grief, yeah. and all that right. Right. is also like, wow, we could, we could maybe actually get universal health care now. Or, <laughs> right. 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 Or, or, you know, or the, the thing about, you know, all the animal shelters are emptied out because people adopted all the animals, you know? And yes. I mean, things that oh, yeah. you yeah. never hoped for. Right. Because it's because there's so much more potential in the sort of absence right. of this certainty about how things are supposed to go. I used to think, you know, W was really bad, but now <laughs> that dissolved. I know. Well... <laughs> I mean, no, I hear, I hear no, it's like a teddy bear. <laughs> it's like, can we have him back? <laughs> right. Dr. Lai, have you read the Shogun Trungpa's Milarepa book? Yeah, I, I, I have the book. I cannot say that I've read. Um, I've browsed through. Yeah. Well, I just started reading it. Mm, mm -hmm. Well, I've been studying him, you know, in the in Chokinima's world, we have Chogum Trumpa book groups. Yes. Because he, he likes him. And so, uh -huh. oh my God, I saw this book. Uh huh. Oh. And uh, I mention it because um, I've only read one of his chapters where he talks about the, the Lingpa, the, 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 the Rakshasa, yeah, the demon, yeah. Rakshasa demoness of Lingpa rock. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And, um, and it's just that his take on it is so, I mean, we did a great job among ourselves talking about uh -huh. it. And then he says all these things that would also be fun to talk about, I think. Right, right. Uh, one of them is he talks about, for example, that the, um, she comes out of a crack in the rock. Right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he says that that is representing this unexplored space. She's in this like unknown mm -hmm. space and anything could be in there because nobody has tamed it or looked mm -hmm. at it or something. Mm -hmm. and, I don't know. And he talks about Dakini energy and oh, yes. stuff. It's really, it's really fun. For me, I'm having a good time reading. Um, <laughs> good. Yeah. Side by side with what we've talked about. So right. Right. Yeah. I mean, as a group, you all can decide like, Hey, let's bring in this book and uh, you know, yeah, uh, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> he gave this, uh, he gave these, the book is two seminars he gave when he first came to America in 1970. Hmm. And he, the only two books that were in English at the time was the Songs of Milarepa, that right. earlier uh, translation, and also the Jewel Ornament of Liberation of Gampopa. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so he taught on those because that's mm. the only thing people could read. I see. And there's a there's a sort of freshness about it because of that, because he wasn't, people didn't know anything else, you know? Yes. He had to start from zero. Right, Explaining right. all the cultural references and yes. nobody knew them. Right, right. So it's it's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I got the book of couple of years back um it just came out maybe a few years ago yeah it's pretty new i got it when we decided to read this book Mm -hmm. i got that one and also the one that's his the life story that you you had suggested we get oh yeah the the the, that's the new translation of the life of milareva right yeah so i got them and they like every other dharma book i get it was been sitting (laughs) around untouched you know (laughs) and i finally thought i want to i have time i'll look at this which one did you recommend there were several versions of the uh, the most recent one uh, Andrew Quintman I think is the translator uh, it's a, maybe a Yale University press book or something like that or I maybe Penguin. Look at that, but I have it but uh yeah we have it in our notes somewhere yeah Andrew Quintman I think is the translator mm. the older one uh, by a Tibetan man uh, Lopsang Lalungpa uh it's the, it's the the vocabulary is a little bit archaic you know just like the older uh songs of milareva vocabulary is a little bit archaic and also uh Lopsan la lumpa kind of left out you know the more outrageous things <laughs> sure mm. yeah, right. but andrew quintman is uh you know he's a classically trained western scholar uh, so he's you know faithful to the text and it's like my job is not to add it you know i'll just translate whatever it's there <laughs> including all these vajras and uh <laughs> rape as a vajra being wielded here and there <laughs> and you're like i don't know what to do with that you know <laughs> well it is what it is you know that's what it says you know <laughs> I put the, um, I found it on Amazon, and so I put it in the chat. Uh huh. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Just for fun, I found uh-huh. that pigeons have ears and they can hear magnetic fields, and I put a link to that article. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You just never know. <laughs> I, so you know, they were listening from a whole nother level to Milarepa. <laughs> oh, the one that you shared, the Milarepa, it's a, it's an audio book. Oh, okay. Well, let me, well, that at least gives you all yeah. that somebody else. I looked up Andrew. Yeah, Andrew Quintman, but that one is an audio <laughs> book. Hold oh. on, Andrew Quintman. I looked that up. Uh, oh, you know what? It's not bringing him up. Yeah, so. Oh, it is. Oh, so, so Andrew Quintman translated or, or wrote a book about, okay, let, let me, let me see. Let me see if this one's it. See if this one's it that you're talking about. I'm just going to go through it. Uh, let's see. Is the Yogan and the Madman reading the biographical corpus? Of- yeah, no, that's that's more. Hold on, that's more the um, his. Uh, it's not a straight up translation. That's his like analysis mm. of of the whole genre of like. Wow, is it a penguin? Yeah. Is it no? No, I found it. Uh, now I'm trying to figure out how to share what I found. It's not coming up for me. Um, uh, here, I, I found it here. Let me, the, the straight up translation, yeah, uh, is this one. Uh, let's see, the straight up translation is this one. And then Andrew Quintman also did a study. Uh, here, the one that I just shared with you, that's the straight up translation of the life of Milareva. That's the one you would recommend? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's and not then if, if you are the geeky kind and you want to okay. learn more about this whole genre of like biography of saints in the Tibetan context, Andrew Quintman wrote a book about that, you know, looking at all the different editions, the earliest editions of Life of Milarepa, later editions and this and that. And he's going to go into talking about the genre of biography of saints in a, 
in Tibetan material. Save the chat. Um, uh, the, the, the short of that is basically uh, like the, the life in Milarepa, songs of Milarepa, they went through the editorial hands of this one figure called Tsangnyong Heruka. Yeah? yeah. So Tsangnyong Heruka, in other words, wasn't just a receiver of traditions and compiler of traditions. Tsangnyong Heruka had a major hand in crafting both uh, the personality of Milarepa as we know him today and the content of these songs. So Andrew Quintman and in his study of this material is going into those historical processes of how the biography of a saint and the corpus of his teachings kind of got crafted over time. May or may not be of interest to everyone, uh, but if you're the geeky kind that likes to learn more about these processes, then, yep, certainly, uh, Quintman is a good scholar. Um, so I was just observing, like, in my other class that I have, where we are reading um, teachings of the founder of Drigong Kagyu, uh, Kyopajik Tensungun. Uh, we're reading one of his, well, technically not his, but his main disciple compiling uh, these statements uh, called Bhajra Statements of the Single Intention. But currently I'm also like commissioning with the help of um, sponsors from all over. Uh, I'm commissioning some translations of the collected teachings of Jiten Sungun. And so I've been working with these two translators, um, editing after they have translated, I would I go through section by section with them. I don't know Tibetan the way they know Tibetan, which is leagues ahead of me, but I know the Dharma. Mm -hmm. And I know enough of Gyopa Jiten Sungun's kind of way of talking about the Dharma. So I, I go through section by section with the translators and kind of like, okay, here I said, I'm going to translate it this way. Does it work with the original Tibetan? <laughs> yeah, that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, in talking to them, uh, one of them said, you know, he said, when I first agreed to do these translations, I was familiar with another author within this lineage three centuries later. Uh, so meaning this person lived in the 15th century. And he said, and I was expecting this 12th century material from the founder of the lineage to be somewhat like what in the 15th century someone from this lineage is writing. And he said, but uh, I was very surprised by how it is not. Hmm. And I said, so, so what, what say more? He said, well, he said, one thing for sure is that in this 12th century material, it seems very raw, huh, those teachings, which also is a polite way of saying, not very organized. <laughs> yeah, not very organized. And I said, yeah, I said, I'm not surprised. And in fact, I too had that re reaction, response earlier on. And to tell the truth, maybe a little bit slightly kind of like embarrassed by it. But now I'm starting to appreciate, I said, this less organized uh, earlier 12th century material. Because oh. between the 12th and the 15th century, Tibetan Buddhism, Tibetan literature, Tibetan writings have become more and more standardized and codified, yeah. including Milarepa songs, 
went through the editorial hands of Zhang Yong Heruka, and he has really shaped it to the expectations. And Zhang Yong Heruka himself lived in, let's see, he is also around 15th century, I think. Let's see, Zhang Yong Heruka, yeah, 15th century. By that point, you know, people are expecting a particular flow to all of these things. So in some ways, I mean, which is not to say, you know, I'm tired of this, I'm not, you know, but in some ways, right, if you read enough of this material, then the moment he starts, you know where he's going to go. <laughs> There's a, you know, all the steps you can anticipate. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas with the 12th century uh, founder of Dragon Lineage, you know, no, you, you never know where he's going to go. That sounds fun. Uh, because it, it's still raw. Mm -hmm. And whoever he's teaching, you know, also don't have a lot of expectations <laughs> of like, oh, step one, step two, step oh, three. Right. So it's kind of fresh, you know, yeah. and it's all over the place from one perspective, but from another perspective, very organic. Yeah, so certainly I see how the, the editorial processes, the, the expectations, you know, of what comes next, what comes next, uh, it's, it's much more codified by the time we come to the 15th century, then 16th, 17th century. Yeah, so, yeah, so there's a lot of beautiful verse and, and, and prose even, coming from the later centuries, but in some ways, they are very predictable. Expectations <laughs> have been put in place. When the teachings are mm -hmm. presented in fragments, mm -hmm. then the reader has to, or listener has to put them together. Yeah. Right. Yes. And that's also in the way then you, you, you kind of, you know, have to do more work but but good work, meaningful work as well. So, time to say ta-ta <laughs> so that the next group can have enough time to figure out technology problems. Last week, I think they canceled it because yeah. they couldn't figure out. Oh, I don't know. There's something weird with Zoom. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's bad. But, uh, and also, we're all volunteers and nobody knows. Right. What's Right, right. Oh, you all have been having Zoom problems? Uh, no, well, the latest one is that I, because I'm the Zoom email person, mm -hmm. I get these emails at weird times saying, your Zoom session is waiting, someone's waiting to enter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've been not, getting those. But they're not, but they're not. They're fake. They're phishing or whatever you call it. So you're not supposed to do anything with them. Yeah. I think it's people, you, you think it's not... I think some people like randomly go in. Maybe that's possible because there yeah. were so many, but it's like, I don't think, so. I don't know. It could be people in other time zones or I don't know, but yes. Maybe. So like for this group, I got an email like it last night, you know, there's someone waiting to join your meeting. It's about to start. And it's like, no. <laughs> so we, we just decided that we would ignore them. Yeah, well, basically it is. Um, it's, it's Zoom, I think, um, telling you when it did not tell you before. It's sort of like keeping so. you maybe. more informed. Yeah, maybe so. Um, because sometimes like one of us with the, that credential might like, let's see how the room looks. And you click. And the minute you click, there's a, there's a record saying you came in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll check. Maybe I can turn off that notification. Yeah, so I think in there, I was also thinking of turning that off. Yeah. Because I don't need to know who came into the room. Right. At random points. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good yeah. uh, Memorial Day weekend, if you all remember. It's actually that. So, yeah. official start of summer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>